tonight. Uh, John Denham, uh, our speaker, is going to not only de debunk that, but show how we need to give Englishness a voice in Labour politics. Uh, John has been publishing about this and he has been leading um, the, the Centre on English Politics at Winchester University, where he is the professor leading that particular initiative. Um, most of you will know that John has one of the most distinguished political careers of any of the speakers that, that we have. I have a whole list, but you probably know what they are. He was Minister of State in the Department of Social Security, member of the Privy Council, of course, Minister of State for Health Services, Minister of State for Policing, Chairman of the Home Affairs, Select Committee, I think, for three years, and the, select, the Secretary of State for Innovation, University and Skills, the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, and ultimately um, was of um, significant strategic help uh, to Ed Miliband when he was leader, and John uh, took on the responsibility of being Parliamentary Private Secretary to him uh, with very, very good impact. Now, it does seem to me that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And the things that John has done in the past were really world-leading on things like international development and energy from the time when he was a city councillor and a county councillor and was writing and speaking and mobilising interest in subjects that didn't have their season then. Englishness, energy, international development are now no longer hot potatoes but hot issues. And that's very, very significantly because our friend, uh, a member of the Fabian National Executive uh, team, and uh, a very good friend, of course, of Southampton, having um, been uh, re-elected three times uh, in Itchin. Uh, John, it is an enormous privilege whenever we have you to speak, and we're looking forward to every word, and we'll hang on every word, and look forward to our debate later. Graham, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you for that introduction. Thank you very much for, for, for coming. And um, let me also uh, thank a number of people in the room who do make their way up to Winchester from time to time when we have events on at the, uh, the University uh, for the Centre on English Identity and Politics. Um, we haven't got the detailed programme for this year, but there will be some interesting events. Uh, I'm, we will certainly at some point have Ruth Davis, who was for a long time the head of Greenpeace, uh, now works for the RSPB as policy officer, but we'll be talking about the relationship between identity and the environment. And I'm hoping, though we're not yet confirmed, that we'll get Stuart McConey as well, who, as well as being a, a wonderful uh, disc jockey, as people would know, um, on Six Music, uh, is the president of the Ramblers Association, has just published a book retracing the line of the uh, Jarrow March of the 19th. 30s, and he, for those of you who think he just plays music, he has incredible political insight into the context of, of cultural events. So anyway, be lovely to see some of you up there. Now, so tonight I want to talk about England. I want to talk about um, the English, English identity. I want to talk about briefly about the way that England is governed and England's place within the Union. But I want to do this, obviously, as somebody who, as Graham said it, rather too much length, actually, Graham, I've uh, been involved with the Labour Party a long time. Um, from, from why should Labour be interested? In this, and, and what should the Labour response be to this set of issues? So I wonder if you, if you, if you bear with me, just to start with the interactive bit before I start droning on. So I, I'm going to <coughs> ask you all to think about your own national identity, and I'm going to give you six choices. Um, any of you who are so political scientists will recognise this as something called the Moreno scale. Uh, so there are going to be six choices for you to put your hands up to. So those of you who are only English will be one. People who are more English than British will be a second. People who are equally English and British, a third. People who are more British than English, a fourth. People who are only British, a fifth. And number six, for simplicity, we'll put other and don't know into that sixth uh, category. OK? Right. So just a quick show of hands. Uh, those who would say you are only English. So we don't have a single only English people. Those who think you are more English than British. OK, so we've got three. Those who would say they're equally English and British. So about seven, seven, yeah. Uh, those who are more British than English. OK, and those who are only British. 
Okay. Well, the first thing we can conclude. Wait, you didn't do others. Oh, and others. Sorry, those who are others and don't know. Others and don't know. Okay, fine. Sorry, you're quite right. Now, what's quite interesting about that is that you are quite an unrepresentative audience. What is really interesting is how different you are to the people out there in England. Um, not as wildly different as in some of these surveys, because interestingly enough, there were very few only British people. And about 12% of the population say they are only British. The most common um, uh, identity in England is to be equally English and British, uh, but there are significantly more people who are only English than there are people who are only British. And if you look in the crude figures, if you, if you put the people who are sort of English or more English on one side, people in the middle, in the middle, and people who are more British than English on the other side, broadly speaking, the polls fluctuate a bit from year to year, but about 40% of the population is equally English and British. The other 60% splits two to one more English than British. Now, the reason I say this is that that's not what the Labour Party membership is like. The Labour Party membership, when we've done these surveys, Labour Party members are much more British than English. Okay? So that's an issue, actually, for the Labour Party that wants to represent the population as a whole, because our own membership is not particularly representative on issues of identity. But it's also an issue in other ways. Um, Ones that probably do worry us, because this isn't just a sort of an interesting cultural thing. Um, what's the biggest issue we're facing at the moment? Brexit, obviously. Okay? What's that got to do with English or British? Well, if I tell you that 75% of the people who identify as British voted Remain, and 80% of the people who identify as English voted Leave, and if you do the categories across, there's like a straight line graph. The, the more British you become, the more, break, the more of a Remainer you were. The more English you were, the more of a Leave you were. Uh, had we done as well amongst English voters as amongst British voters, we wouldn't be leaving the European Union. So these are real important issues. They affect things. But why is this question of identity and what people in political parties think important? Well, it's partly the way people view the world. The elite in this country, which turns out to well, quite a lot of the Labour Party, the elite in this country, though not in this room, tends to think it is British, tends to think that British and English are more or less the same thing, and tends to think you don't need to talk about England, you just talk about Britain. Because thinking about Brexit, what, what was the Remain campaign called in Scotland? Scotland? Scotland stronger in Europe. What was the Remain campaign called in Wales? Wales? Wales, stronger in Europe. What was it called in England? Britain, stronger in Europe. Now, you might have thought that if your problem is not with your British voters, but with your English voters, running your campaign as England stronger in Europe, as they did in Scotland and Wales, might have been a sensible thing to do. But actually, the Remain campaign were told this and utterly resisted doing it because it was run by the sort of people who didn't think these things mattered and thought that British and English were pretty much the same thing. Let's bring it closer to home, where I find that my notes have already switched themselves off. Um, we just had a general election. And actually, I'll be one of those who admit we did a lot better in the general election than I thought we were going to do in the general election. If people who identify as English had voted Labour as strongly as people who voted British, Jeremy Corbyn would now be Prime Minister. Now, it wasn't as bad as in 2015, but of the people who only identified as English, Labour was third and a bad third between UKIP and the Tories. Um, we pulled back a bit in 2017, partly because Labour was successful in getting back some, about one in four of the UKIP voters they'd had before. But nonetheless, there was a real disparity. So we'll try to unpick why this happens. But to simply be dismissive of identity would be a mistake, given the strong evidence, and I could give you loads more, same in the Tory party as well, about the correlations between identity and attitudes. Now, what is it about identity, though, that matters? Because it's true in ordinary conversation, people don't 
operationalise their identity. When you were campaigning in the referendum campaign, you didn't come across people saying, well, I'm voting Remain because it's the British thing to do. And you probably didn't come across many people saying, well, I'm voting Leave because that's the English thing to do. Um, it's more a matter, when we're talking about identity, of having a respect for the people, the way people describe themselves. Though, if I put it this way, if, you were, if we were running an election campaign meeting here with the people who worship at this church and you were speaking, you would begin by acknowledging the fact that you're in a church and most of your audience were worshippers. Um, you wouldn't, if you were well advised, go on to tell them they're under a theological obligation to vote Labour. That would probably be going too far, but you, know, you, you might do something about Labour owing more to Methodism and Marxism and all that sort of stuff. But it would be a matter of acknowledging who they were and who they are. Um, if you're in a mosque, it would be the same thing. You, you wouldn't ignore the fact, you, you wouldn't again say there was a theological reason why a Muslim might vote Labour, you wouldn't ignore the fact you were talking to a Muslim audience. When confronted with somebody who says they're English, quite a lot of people in the Labour Party sort of go, oh my God, they're a neo-Nazi. Uh, they then go, oh, you're, you're English. All right. Well, you must be very worried about immigration. Well, let me tell you, the thing about immigration is it's not about immigration. It's because we don't spend enough money on housing in the National Health Service. Is that OK? That is not respecting people. That's disrespecting people in two ways. It's not actually being prepared to talk to people in the way they describe themselves. And secondly, in that little story, it's actually imputing on somebody a set of values they may well not hold because we have prejudiced views about what they believe. When I, when I first started saying, as, as a professor of English identity and politics, I mean, I had numerous conversations amongst people who said, English identity, that's all about the English Defence League, that's all about Nazis, that's all about the far right, isn't it? And I usually had to start by explaining that there are more people in this country, in, in, in England, who identify as English than there are as people who identify as British. Now, that's either an awful lot of neo-Nazis, rather more than most of us have noticed, or actually Englishness turns out to be shared by a very, very large number of people. So let me tell you a little bit about what we know about people who say they're English and what they mean by it, although I'll be the first to admit that we're probably short of a lot of the information we want. The first is, it matters a lot to people. About half the population of England identify as English, but also, when asked how intensely they feel English, they put themselves as seven on a scale of naught to seven. That is, half the population of England feel English as intensely as they believe it is possible to be. Now, a, a fair chunk of the population who are British, and, and sometimes these are the same people, as we've said, feel intensely British, but not as many and not to the same extent. So this is an identity that matters to people. Politically, are they all on the right? Well, it's very interesting. If you look at the services that are done about what people think about how much money we should spend on the NHS or uh, redistribution through taxation or things like that, there is actually no evidence that people who identify as English are any more to the right, any more conservative on these and a whole range of other activities than people who identify as British. So the idea that this is a, an automatically right wing group of people is not necessarily the case. Similarly, that's true on values. It is true they tend to be more socially conservative. Uh, they tend to be more concerned about uh, immigration. And that is absolutely true. It is also true that there is a core of Englishness which is overtly and explicitly racist. But it's quite a small core who actually, probably 5 to 10% on the surveys that you do. Um, nor is it true that most people who are English think that of English as an ethnic identity. Again, there is a core who do, about 25%, which is not an insignificant number, would say you have to be white to be English. But that leaves 75% who wouldn't. And the other thing is, and perhaps in contrast with Britishness, it's generally accepted by most surveys, about 80% of people in all surveys, that Englishness is an identity that comes with birth, place of birth or where your parents were born. And that does mean it's a more conditional identity. It's something that's not as easily as 
uh, as easily accessible to the brand new migrant as Britishness, which you can become British by passing a test that most of you and I would fail uh, and sending you off the check and you can become British. It's a sort of low threshold. But that doesn't mean that people think that you therefore have to be white to be English, but it's something that comes in time, which is actually, of course, exactly what we see happening ar around us with, for example, cricketers like Moen Ali, who is a third generation English person who speaks very powerfully about being both English and a Muslim. So the stereotypical view of this group of uh, voters as inevitably uh, to the right uh, doesn't seem to come out of the evidence. What is coming out, though, pretty strongly, is that the group of people who are most likely to feel uh, <coughs> English are the people who, in a broad sense, have been at the losing end of most social and economic and demographic changes over <coughs> the last 30 years, but also believe they have not been listened to. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it coincides so much with the Leave vote. Because the Leave vote was above all a vote amongst people who did not like the way the country was working and thought it worked for some people but didn't think that it worked for them. They tend to be in those communities where there's a sense of loss of strong community values and there's those <coughs> communities where very rapid immigration is seen as most undermining to communities that already feel on the defensive. So there is a correlation between those communities and a sense of feeling Englishness. So that's sort of the challenge that, if you like, we've got, is to construct an appeal as a party <coughs> to those voters on many issues like taxation, like the NHS, um, like uh, public ownership. They're very much on a Labour agenda. On other issues, they're much less comfortable with what they see as basically metropolitan, big city, liberal, middle class labour, as labour appears to many of them um, these days. So I think it's worth thinking a bit about what some of this means. Well, I've talked a bit about what it meant in 2017, but also the next election. <coughs> because the next general election, if there is going to be a labour government, and Although, as I say, we've vastly exceeded my expectations and most other people's, um, we are only just ahead of the Tories. And I was around long enough in the 1980s where we used to be 12 or 15% ahead of the Tories in between general elections, and we still kept losing the general elections. So being 3 or 4% ahead and winning a few council by-elections is not the same as being on the verge of power. But if you look at where we need to win seats, they are not in big cities. And they're not, there's a bit of an exception here, in large university towns. They're in smaller cities and towns <coughs> that tend to be older, more working class, more economically deprived, uh, and more leave inclined than the population as a whole. And it is in those places where people's sense of identity and Englishness is also likely to be strongest. And as many as you will know, I mean, something really weird has happened in the last 10 to 15 years, in which the culmination happened in 2017, is that Labour has been losing ground in precisely those types of seats, or not winning it back enough, and gaining ground <coughs> in new places. So, if you look here, Test used to be the marginal, and itch in the safe Labour seat. Mm. Test is now the safe Labour seat, and itch in is the marginal. In Portsmouth, we won Portsmouth South. It's the middle-class university part of the town above all else. But Portsmouth North, that used to have a Labour MP up to 2010, we're 10,000 votes behind. And you can go into Reading, you can go to Plymouth, you can go to Norwich, you can see this. So, so Labour's problem, in a sense, is that we have and that those North Kent towns, that again we held up to 2005, 2010, we are unbelievably far away from winning. But those are the types of areas where we have to knit, win the seats next time round. And I would argue, um, not that uh, this Englishness thing is the answer to everything. Oh, my goodness me, it's not. You know, policy, leadership, all of those other things are absolutely critical to the mix. But one of the things we need to be doing is talking to people in the language that they wish to be talked to, and that is to respect and address their identity. Um, I mean, why do we need to do that? Because that might mean changing the way we communicate, changing our message to some extent. 
although the party is beginning to do that controversially, but I think rightly. Um, there was a bit of English branding on, in the Stoke uh, by-election, for example. But why, why do we need to win these seats? Can't we just go back to doing what we always used to do, is winning Scotland and Wales instead? And there are two reasons why that's a dodgy strategy for us to rely on. The first is, electorally, there's not much more to be got out of Wales. And in Scotland, it's incredibly volatile. Tiny swings in votes in Scotland can either deliver a Labour landslide, a Tory landslide, or an SNP landslide. So it would be wrong to um, bank on it. But the second issue, and this is really the second part I want to talk about, is that it is going to become increasingly untenable for Labour to hope to govern England with consent if it's not winning a majority in England or getting very close to it. Um, the more that devolution becomes entrenched, the idea that a Labour government can, if you like, impose Labour policies on England without winning in England will be more and more difficult. It was bad enough under the last Labour government uh, where on foundation hospitals and tuition fees, huge numbers of Labour MPs opposed both those policies, English Labour MPs, they only happened in England because Scottish and Welsh MPs to whom those policies would not apply were whipped through the lobbies to vote for them. Now, hopefully Jeremy's not going to introduce tuition fees. That would be quite a, 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 big, that would be quite a, a U turn. But difficult issues will arise and it will become much less acceptable to the public that these issues are being determined by MPs who are not from England. We saw some of that in the 2015 election. The Alex Salmon poster, Ed Miliband in the pocket, loads of people saying, we don't want people from Scotland telling a government how things should be run here. Now, I think the party is completely off the speed and hasn't grasped the importance of this issue. But with the devolution that's already in the pipeline, you could now potentially have different income tax rates in Scotland and in England. Imagine a Labour government and a Labour Chancellor using Scottish Labour MPs to insist that the English paid a different level of income tax to the people of Scotland. You're going to have, or could have, if the parties get their act together, a different corporation tax level in Northern Ireland to the rest of the mainland. Imagine a government uh, imposing a different corporation tax level that people in England might like to see. The, 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 there's many different scenarios. So, in my view, it's going to be increasingly essential that Labour win aims for an English majority uh, to avoid the complications of devolution. We are at the moment the only part of the UK, and you as voters in England are the only part of the UK where on health, universities and schools and many other issues of domestic policy, you are not able to elect people to determine those things for England. The way our constitution now is that MPs from other parts of the Union can vote on those issues, even with the introduction of English votes on English laws, but uh, the same in Scotland, they have people directly elected to do those things. Um, so the danger of Labour legitimacy, a Labour, UK Labour government lacking legitimacy in England is something that shouldn't be um, underestimated. So in the short term, we need to aim for a Labour majority in England. In the longer term, as a party, we need to do more thinking about how the union needs to be reshaped in the, in the future. It's very clear that the union is still in a shaky situation. Um, yes, there's been some drawing back on the independence movement in Scotland, but I think it would be unwise to assume that's gone forever. Uh, the inevitable consequence of Brexit will be to create some sort of unique position in Northern Ireland in relation to the rest of the Union. And let's say England's own position is, anom is anomalous. Issues about fairness and the transfer of resources across the Union are not going to go away. People are not terribly happy about the Barnet formula, which is seen to favour people in Scotland over people in England. We have a government at the moment which has taken a billion pounds of English taxpayers' money and give it to the DUP in order to keep themselves in power. These issues will not go away, and if we want to have a stable Union, um, which after all was originally created for an empire that no longer exists, 
we want to have a stable union, we need to have the constitutional convention that we called for in our last manifesto, we need to have the relationship of equals between nations in the United Kingdom, which was also called for in the last Labour manifesto, but we need to have a bit more of a serious debate about what that would actually look like. Um, you could build on the current English votes for English laws, some people favour an English parliament, but something that is better than we have at the moment is essential. We obviously also know, and you'll hear this all the time from councillors, we need devolution within England. England is an incredibly highly uh, centralised state. But some times people come along and say, well, you don't need to do anything about decision making at an English level, let's just have devolution. But let's be very clear that what is has ever been on offer is not the same as what they have in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Where they have their own governments, they can make their own legislation. What we have only ever been offered here, including under the last Labour government, is administrative devolution. The right to deliver central government policy better because you're delivering it locally. That is a much smaller deal than has been provided to the other nations through devolution. So that's a discussion that we should have. So just to wrap up on a couple of points, as was mentioned in the advertising for this, uh, a few of us, including people like Judith Blake, who's the leader of Leeds City Council, John Crudus, um, uh, Dagenham MP, Sam Tarry, who ran Jeremy Corbyn's uh, second leadership campaign, uh, Shabana Mahmood, uh, West Midlands MP, and a number of others have started something called the English Labour Network. And the aim of the network, which we only launched a few weeks ago, is simply to try to raise this whole set of issues within the party in the way that they haven't been before. Um, we want to be practically orientated. Um, we don't actually have uh, all the answers to these questions of how do you integrate talking about Englishness <coughs> into our normal political campaigning. We certainly don't pretend to have the answers to the constitutional issues that I've raised today. What brings us together is a really strong belief that just as ignoring England has led in part to the cost of losing the European Union, continuing to, to ignore England is likely to have similarly bad consequences for the Labour Party, both in trying to get into government uh, and in, in governing. And we want the output of the network really to be uh, practical stuff that activists could take off and do. Take off and do. <laughs> what, rather, I mean, there are enough websites in the world where people write blogs saying Labour should. There's not a shortage of blog sites where people say Labour should. I think what, what, what we really want to do is to put out material that's useful in campaigning terms. Just to add one point, though, finally, about Englishness. In my view, this is not just about trying to understand what Englishness is and reflecting it back to people. National identities are not discovered by reading history books, which is why the current Radio 4 programme is so disappointing. Um, they are created. National identities are constantly created and recreated. And we drop bits that no longer work for us and we include new bits. There is no point in pretending that most people have seen the story of Englishness as a multiracial, multi-ethnic <coughs> story. The point is, it is increasingly and it can be more so. But we need to make practical, take practical steps to do that. Which is why those of you who've been to the St George's Day Festival that we've organised in Southampton over the last few years have been to an event that is both if you like, defiantly English, but actually incredibly inclusive of other communities who are or will be part of the English story in this city in the future. It means drawing on traditions, the radicalism of English history, ideas like the common good, that the judgment of whether a society is good or not is whether it delivers for the common people. Uh, ideas of liberty and being free born. These are ideas that come up time and time again over hundreds of years, a thousand years of English history. Reviving those now is very important. If you're talking about elites, if you're talking about the way the business is run, the idea of the common good is a good way of talking about that and the recent report by Institute of Policy Research uh, did that. 
we need to think about how we talk about the fact that history has given us the world's language and also a population with links with every part of the world and make that part of our national story and global in reach. So this is not, um, this is not if you like, uh, a backward-looking exercise. It's about creating an Englishness that works. So why, again, should we do that? Well, one of the things we've lost is types of identity that went with an old industrial economy. Um, you know, when I first stood for Parliament, there were 15,000 men, and they would virtually all have been men, working in manufacturing industry in the city, <coughs> workplaces, each of which had more than 1,500 people in them. And they were all in trade unions. And they all lived in the same communities and went to the same churches, went to the same trades, uh, social clubs, had the same sports clubs. That generated a type of working class identity that had made Southampton a Labour city. Those incredibly strong identities are not produced by the type of economy that we've got at the moment. Uh, the working class hasn't gone away. The working class is probably bigger and more insecure than it was in the days that we had all of those factories. But it doesn't produce the same political identities. These identities of place, of national identity, actually provide the opportunity of being a new form of solidarity a new form of people coming together and saying, let's make this nation, let's make this country work for us. And that's the challenge, I think, for the left, to take that on board. Not to shy away from it, because nationalism undoubtedly has its downsides. Not to shy away and leave it to people, malign people on the right to define national identity, to, but to make it our own. That, I think, is uh, a project for the next, not a couple of years, 10, 15 years, but I think it's important. And I think if we look at the demise of social democratic parties across Europe, yet another one's bit in the dust this week in Norway, uh, once governing party for much of the post-war period, now fifth in the Norwegian elections, it is largely because they have failed to respond to the changing politics uh, of a different type of economy. And I've no doubt the national identity is part of that. Thank you very much.